I've been struck this week about how many of us have questions. We all have questions. Everyone in this room has questions. And we're all searching for something. And sometimes we're doing that in a really obvious way, but sometimes it's just there in the background. And we might not admit it to other people. We might not even admit it to ourselves. But we've all got questions and we're all searching. And particularly at the start of a new year, the questions seem to flood in. People take a moment, they kind of take stock of maybe their partner, their relationships, their husband or their wife, and they kind of think, is this coming up to scratch? Uh, Tomorrow apparently is called Divorce Monday, uh, where maybe because of uh, the particular stresses of spending a week trapped in the house with your partner and their extended family, um, three times as many people as usual uh, visit a divorce lawyer, actually. Or at least that's what the divorce lawyers would like us to believe. And if you're tempted by that, let me just say, uh, the marriage course starts in a week, (laughs) and uh, it's much more fun and a lot cheaper. Uh, (laughs) But then the the, the next next Monday is apparently called Blue Monday, and that's apparently the, the Monday of the year when people are most likely to feel down. And they even have a ridiculous equation for it. It's based on the distance from Christmas, the distance to your payday, the distance to your next likely holiday. And I don't know how you're wired, but I'm wired as a kind of relentless optimist. Uh, I'm not a a glass half empty person or a glass half full person. I'm just a glass full person. And so when I hear about days like this, I take it as a kind of a challenge, a gauntlet laid down by the media for me to respond to. So on Divorce Monday, I think, right, how can I appreciate my wife all the more and show her how much I love her? On Blue Monday, I'm going, this is going to be the happiest Monday of my year. I'm going to do everything I can to be happy today. But those days are symptoms of the fact that people are asking questions. People are searching. Where am I headed? Am I happy with how my life has turned out? Is my career fulfilling me? How do I know I'm making a difference? Am I being true to myself? Is this person the one? Am I ever going to find the one? Is there such a thing as the one? Do I really know my partner? Do I really know myself? Have I found myself? The questions fly around. But I think what underlines those questions is a sense, perhaps we all feel from time to time, of feeling a bit lost. You look up and you look around and you think, why am I in this job, this relationship? How did I end up here? I uh, recently read an article in Forbes magazine, a magazine aimed at desirable, successful, um, wealthy people, and people like me who aspire to be desirable, (laughs) successful, and wealthy. And it asked a very simple but a very striking question. Why do I feel lost? It gave some suggestions, a sense of drift, busyness which drives out passion, a loss of purpose, feeling isolated. And there's others, maybe you've made a mistake, you've messed up, you feel like You've let God down in some way. Why do I feel lost? And that's exactly the question our passage for today speaks to. So we're going to look at Luke 15 from verse 1 to 7, which will come up on the screens. It's also on page 1058 of the Blue Bibles, which should be in the chairs you're sitting on. So Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. First thing this passage tells us is that God passionately pursues us. I think it's so interesting to see the context of this story. Jesus tells that there are people who are drawn to Jesus. People who are captivated by him, who gather around him. And they're the tax collectors, those who are considered traitors, by most people because they collaborated with the occupying army. 
and sinners is how they're described. People who uh, probably left, led a, a kind of openly immoral life, a kind of um, outwardly immoral life. Basically, the people no one else wants to be associated with, the outsiders, the people respectable people steer clear of. They're the ones who gather around to see Jesus and draw near to hear him. There's something about what he's saying, what he was doing, how he lived that was captivating to them. And they came close. When you look and sound like Jesus, outsiders will want to be near you. When the church looks and sounds like Jesus, outsiders will want to come in. And what happens is the religious people, the kind of moral, sensible people, they start to mutter. They say, these people, you know, they're the people doing bad stuff. And Jesus is welcoming them. And not only that, he's gathering them around his table. It's outrageous. It's shocking. And Jesus hears them. And in response, he tells them a story. And it appears simple. It almost appears like a child's story. But it is deeply profound and highly provocative. Jesus says, you're upset about me going after the lost and welcoming them back. You who claim to be religious, let me tell you a story about a sheep that was lost and a shepherd that went to find it. So he starts, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lost one of them. So the sheep is lost. And the thing is that if a shepherd is not paying attention, the sheep will get lost. Sheep get lost all the time. Sheep aren't one of nature's brightest creatures. Here's a picture of one. (laughs) <laughs> looks sweet looks a little bit gormless um, it's got a face that says I eat grass uh, and that's actually what they do basically a sheep will just move around from spot to spot finding the next patch of grass to nibble on they just keep going they're focused solely on what's the end of their nose on what's at the end of their nose that's, that's what they're focused on and um, you know, intelligent creatures like humans wouldn't, wouldn't be like that at all But I've noticed from time to time that sometimes people walk around a little bit like this, focused on what's the end of their nose. And there's always a danger of them getting lost. Sometimes you see at tube platforms, people step very close to the edge of the platform. And then they look up and they think, how did I get here? Because they're focused on what's directly in front of them and not anything else. And that's actually exactly how uh, sheep act. That's how they behave. That's why sometimes if you're out in the countryside, you'll see a sheep on the edge of a cliff, just kind of completely confused that it's there. You'll see a sheep halfway up a mountain on a ledge. You think, how did that sheep get there? And the answer is, it just followed the next patch of grass and the next patch of grass until it ended all the way up there. And I've actually had an experience quite like that in life. When I was uh, working as a barrister, I was absolutely fixated on the next case I did. So I was focused on the next case, and then the next case, and then the next case. And everything else in my life started to take a bit of a back seat. And I guess somewhere in my head I thought, well, you haven't really paid any attention to my faith, my friends, my church. It's it's kind of drifted a bit. But I'll sort all that stuff out. But after I've done the next case... And then the next case would come along, it was even more fascinating, interesting, high profile than the last one, and I thought, well, after the next case, after the next case. And then I woke up one day, and I suddenly felt a bit lost. I thought, I didn't expect life to feel like this. I realized that I was just completely obsessed with becoming really successful in my career and earning a stack of money. And so I was just focused on the next rung of the ladder. And I couldn't work out really how I'd got there. But what I knew was that I needed to make a change. Otherwise, I was going to get really lost. And so I did. I changed my routine. I started to read the Bible. I started to pray and worship in the morning. I I reconnected with my church in a new way. And the reason is that I realized, I realized that I wasn't actively shaping my life. The urgency of the next thing in my life was actually shaping me. And I knew I had to make a change. So uh, sheep get lost. And when they get lost, it's the shepherd's job to find them quickly. And actually, I know, I know quite a bit about being a shepherd. 
Uh, I, I grew up next, next door to a farm, uh, Lucy Farm Estate in central Luton. Um, it's not many sheep there, quite a lot of concrete. Um, but on that, on that estate was a school, my primary school. And when I was eight years old, I was asked, great honour, to play the second shepherd in the nativity school play. So I'm quite experienced through all of this. And, uh, and there were three, the first shepherd, the second shepherd, and the third shepherd. And in the play, they all came to the baby Jesus after the baby Jesus was born, and they brought him presents. And I know you're thinking, that's kings, not shepherds. I didn't write the play. I don't... <laughs> So, so, we, we, um, so we, we turned up, and the first shepherd came to the crib, this is in the play, and had to kneel down and say, I give you my most valuable possession, I give you a sheep, and handed over a sheep to the baby Jesus, which m- means I've always known the value of sheep. It's not, not a great present for a baby, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with it, like ride it, I mean, but anyway, so he gave his sheep to the, um, to the baby Jesus, and then, uh, and then I was the second shepherd, so I had to kneel down and give my shawl. So I said, I give you my shawl to keep you warm. Slightly better present, I thought. And, uh, and then the third shepherd um, knelt down and said, uh, oh, I, don't, I don't have anything to give you, but I give you my heart. It's quite a good line. Uh, but then on the big night, it didn't quite work out as we'd planned. Because the first shepherd performed brilliantly, knelt down, handed over his sheep to the baby Jesus, and then me, the second shepherd, knelt down, and then reached for my shawl and realized, in all the excitement, I'd left my shawl off stage. And so I'd stuck facing the baby Jesus, hundreds of people in the audience, with nothing to give him. And so I had to think quite quickly. So I kind of looked out at all these people. I looked at the third shepherd. I thought for a moment. (laughs) I looked back at the baby Jesus, and I said, I have nothing to give you, (laughs) but I give you my heart. The look of hurt and betrayal on the face of the third shepherd will haunt me for the rest of my life. And he kind of looked, and he knelt down, and he said, I have nothing to give you, but I give you my heart. Not Not my finest moment. But there were two things I learned. One, that sheep are very valuable. And two, that actually it's quite difficult being a shepherd. If you don't pay attention, you'll lose your shawl. You'll probably lose some sheep as well. So Jesus says, when the sheep is lost, does the shepherd not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep? You think about it for a moment. You think, hmm, well, maybe, but maybe not. If you think about it purely in cost-benefit terms, look at the maths. I mean, surely 99 sheep in the hand is far better than one sheep in the bush. Shouldn't the shepherd just cut his losses? Very fond of that sheep, but (laughs) bye, good luck. It's tricky. It doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly not in the Middle East, because it's dangerous. It's not like it is in England. In England, we don't have any wild animals, really, who will kill you in the wilderness, in in, in the countryside. I actually looked, you know, in the top 10 wild animals in the UK to kill you, one of them is a cow. I mean, how does a cow kill you? Does it sit on you until you squash to death? But in the Middle East at that time, there were bears, leopards, hyenas, jackals, wolves, and lions roaming around. And the thing is, when a sheep is lost, it lets out this kind of, ma, ma. It's like a homing beacon, supposed to be for the shepherd, but all the wild animals know that sound, and they know it means lunch. So, so you, it's quite tricky. And if you're a shepherd on your own, it's complex, it's dangerous. You could be tempted to cut your losses. Focus on what you still have. And we can be tempted to think like that. You know, life is tough enough as it is. It's so busy, I've got work, I've got family, I've got friends, all this stuff going on. You know, I just need to focus on me and mine. I can't be worried about what's going on with other people. You know, my colleagues, my friends, they're going to have to work it all out for themselves. I can't take the risk of trying to help them. But the good shepherd goes after the sheep. That's how much he cares for the lost sheep. They're apparently risking everything else through difficult terrain, through dangerous, you know, wild animals. He searches for how long? For an hour, until it gets dark, until he finds it, whatever it takes. There's a persistence to the pursuit, 
a relentlessness to the recovery, to the rescue. The shepherd seeks until he finds. Why? Because the sheep matters that much to the shepherd. And just because it's lost doesn't mean it's lost any of its value to him. A couple of years ago, Beth and I um, took our eldest girl, B, to Centre Park. I don't know if you've ever been to Centre Parks. It's basically a holiday park in the middle of a forest. And the centrepiece is what's quite grandly called a subtropical swimming paradise. And uh, it's basically this mass complex of interconnected swimming pools and fun things and slides and all that kind of stuff. And so we were there. We all love swimming. We're having a great time. And B had found this slide she absolutely loved. So she was about three and she was running to the top of the slide, sliding down it, running to the top of the slide. And we were kind of waiting in the pool to catch her. And uh, she did it probably 100, maybe 150 times. And then one time we were there waiting at the bottom of this slide, she ran up and she didn't come down. And there was about a meter of the walkway which was covered by a palm tree, slightly obscured. And I suddenly thought, oh, where's she gone? So I jumped out of the pool, ran round, looked on the stairs, she wasn't there. Looked around, she wasn't there. Couldn't find her anywhere. Beth and I split up, ran, started running around, and you kind of look out and you have absolute terror because you realize there are about 2,000 people and lots of water and your three-year-old daughter's gone missing. And so you're searching, you're looking, you're trying to find where she might be. You search this pool, that pool, looking there, looking there, barging people out of the way, running around. We ran around to the other side of the complex, hit into each other, suddenly realized neither of us has her yet. It's been like a minute or two minutes. We're starting to really panic. We run back to one pool, and see, just in time, our brave, adventurous, completely fearless daughter walking into this mass of waves caused by a wave machine in this pool. And we just managed to fish her out in time. And then we just held her for about an hour because we were so relieved, so desperately thankful that we had found her again. That was how we felt. It might surprise you, but you know, God feels that about you. God feels that way about you. She was lost for what was it probably only a couple of minutes. In our lives, it felt like an age. But just because she was lost, she didn't lose any of her, her value to us. She's so precious to us. We, would de- we weren't searching half-heartedly, casually. We were desperately running around that place to try and find her. You might feel like you've drifted away, like you're a bit far from God. You might feel a bit lost, but you haven't lost any of your value to God. Jesus is saying he will pay any price, go to any length to find you. And you might have people in your life that you long to encounter Jesus, maybe family members, friends, people at work. And you you think, well, I've, I've prayed for them, I've invited them once to Alpha, what more is there to be done? And my whole perspective on this shifted when someone said to me once, has it ever occurred to you that God might care more, even more about your friends coming to know him than you do? That you aren't on your own when you pray that prayer, send that text, start that conversation in the pub after work. That Jesus knows your friend, your colleague, your brother, your sister, your, even your partner better than you do. And he is interceding for you. He's praying for you as you take a risk, as you invite them to Alpha, as you invite them to something. And sometimes that's all it takes. Taking a step, 10 second burst of faith, Instead of thinking, well, what if this doesn't work? Thinking, what if it does? What a difference that could make. When you take a step towards the lost, you're not on your own. Jesus goes before you and he is with you. And don't give up. When I was a barrister, I worked as a barrister. And for the seven years I was a barrister, I prayed for someone, anyone of my colleagues to come to know Jesus And I invited them to things, I prayed for them, had long drawn out, passionate conversations in the pub after work. And um, actually no one did during that time. And then 15 months ago, uh, one of them walked in here on a Wednesday night to come to Alpha, someone called Heather. And 
I think she was as shocked as I was to see her here. And over the course of that term, doing Alpha, she encountered Jesus. And it's amazing to see what she's doing now. She's become a connect group leader. She's done our preaching training. She's going to give a talk on Alpha this term. It's amazing to see. And I am so thankful. And I hope there's more fruit from that seven years. I don't know. But I tell you what, if that's it, if it's just one person from those seven years, it's worth it. Every time I see her, I think it's worth it. It's worth it for the one. Don't give up. So the shepherd goes after the sheep. And what, when he finds it, what does he do? He joyfully lifts it up and puts it on his shoulders. And you think, well, why doesn't he just lead it home? And the reason is that when a shepherd uh, gets lost, it's so panicked, it's so scared, it's frozen with fear, that if the shepherd doesn't pick it up, there's no way of it getting home. So the shepherd picks up the sheep. But it's important you don't get the wrong idea. Um, we're not talking about something like this, you know, just like casually picking up, we're all very happy. Um, this isn't even a lamb. You know, if, are you, you've, those of you who eat meat, you might have eaten a leg of lamb. They can be quite large. They're delicious. They're very tasty. Um, that, is, that is just a baby sheep. You've eaten a baby sheep. Sorry to break that to you. Um, if you hadn't realized it, yeah. Um, but they're delicious. They're amazing. But that is, that is only a lamb. And they can be quite large leg of lambs. A sheep is much, much bigger. A sheep can be 80 or even 100 kilos, 14 or 15 stone. Sheep are la- a fully grown sheep is larger, heavier than I am. Imagine trying to pick me up and carry me on your shoulders, going through the wilderness, the dark, wild animals snapping at your heels. Does that sound fun? No. Does it sound hard? Yes. Would you do it joyfully? Probably not. But the shepherd picks up the sheep. There's a cost to the rescue. And the good shepherd bears the cost, takes the risk, carries the burden, and he does it joyfully. Actually, the only way to carry something that weighs that much is on your shoulders. In exactly the same way that Jesus carried his cross. If you remember nothing else, I want you to go away remembering this. The Son of God loves you and gave himself for you. He actually died for you. When I realized that, when I believed that, it transformed my life. It gave me a deeper peace, a greater joy. It gave me a greater sense of my true identity, my purpose. I felt like I'd been found. And there's been times since then, like a sheep, that I've wandered off. I've drifted away. I've gone my own path. I've made a mistake. I've made a decision which I regret. And every time, Jesus has picked me up and brought me home. And Jesus says when he gets the sheep home, there's a huge party. Sounds great. Why? Because the shepherd has saved the sheep. And Jesus says in the same way, when someone repents, there's a a party in heaven. I think it's quite interesting. What does the sheep do to repent? She goes, ma. It simply lets the shepherd pick it up, put it on his shoulders, and carry it home. I mean, sometimes we overcomplicate the idea of repentance. You might have an image of repentance that comes from someone on Oxford Street shouting into a megaphone, saying, repent. Like, that's your image of God shouting down from heaven, saying, repent. Jesus says, repentance means letting him pick you up and bring you home. It's not complicated, but it will transform your life. I don't know where you are today. You might, you might just be sitting there thinking, actually, in my heart, I feel there is something I've messed up. It might be in a tiny way, a small way. In the last week, the last month, you think there's something there. I want to know that I am back in my shepherd's arms. Probably not for the first time. Maybe for the hundredth time. feel like I've messed up. I want to know without any doubt that I'm back in the shepherd's arms. You might be here, and if you're honest, 
you know, you know Alpha starting in 10 days, but you've given up hope for your kind of colleagues and friends. Look at how the shepherd pursues the lost sheep. Look at how much it matters to God that they are found. You're not going out on a limb when you invite people. He goes before you and is with you. You might feel on one level, I know all this, but if you're honest in your heart, you feel like you've drifted off. And you're not even sure when that happened. Life just got busy. And you look up now and God, God seems quite far away. Might be the key question for you this year is, how am I going to stick close to Jesus? You might be here and you've got all sorts of questions. We heard earlier on about questions. And for you, you've never done Alpha before, and that's the thing for you. Actually, I want to come with my questions next Wednesday, the 18th of Jan. We'd love to invite you to come. And maybe there's some here today, I think there are, and you've been searching for something. You might have been searching for days or weeks or months, but you thought maybe you were searching for God. And actually, God is searching for you. He's searching for you. And it's no accident you're here today. I'm Bear Grylls. My favourite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.